Hi, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Sustainable SG Collective, I'd like to thank all attendees, speakers, and our moderator today for joining us on the Saturday afternoon as we cautiously move towards the end of our circuit breaker period. I hope everyone is healthy and safe at home and keeping meaningfully occupied. My name is David Chia. I'm a trainee lawyer and a member of Sustainable SG Collective. We are an education platform and a coordinating group of committed individuals coming from a wide spectrum from our community. Our wish is to spread the message of sustainability to individuals and to the community. We are an informal group of friends and volunteers. It is deliberately kept fluid. Our goal is to provide a platform to coordinate programs that can drive awareness about sustainability issues. Additionally, we hope to be the hub for common scientific and policy-related knowledge, infusing and diffusing the information and knowledge on the climate occurrences we are experiencing today. In doing so, we aim to galvanize a change in choices and practices at the individual and hopefully at the national level. Our moderator for today is Mr. Aslam Sada. He has been in the sphere of the adult learning space. He has moderated and facilitated many sessions over the years. So he's experienced. He is our convener and he's also a district councillor with the Southwest CDC. And his full-time job is a vice president of enterprise learning at ST Engineering and Electronics. I understand that today's session is an informal session, so you may choose to not have your face displayed on our screen, and you can choose to have it displayed as well. It is up to your choice. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Aslam, our moderator for today. Aslam, please. Okay, thank you so much, David. Uh, and of course, first off, a uh, very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I'm just looking at the number of participants we have today, and I'm very glad to report that we have about 172 uh, participants in this uh, webinar, the first webinar of uh, Sustainable SG. So uh, again, you know, a very big thank you to all who have taken their Saturday uh, off to join us. And uh, I hope everyone is doing well, um, safe and healthy as we, you know, plow through the final parts of our, or rather the final few days of our circuit breaker and look forward to the opening. Uh, today, we are very, very fortunate to have three extremely illustrious uh, speakers joining us to talk about a very interesting topic. The topic is the circuit, the circuit breaker of unsustainable practices. So clearly, uh, we're borrowing some of the words uh, used, you know, circuit breaker and sustainable or unsustainable practice to hear what our speakers have to say. But let me introduce our speakers to you first. Uh, we have with us Professor Ko Lien Pin. Professor Ko brings 16 years of international research experience uh, in the field of sustainability and environmental science, having worked in institutions across Europe, Australia, and the United States. He recently joined NUS as Professor and Director of the University's new Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions who seeks to produce cutting-edge science to inform climate policies, strategies, and actions in Singapore and the Asia-Pacific region. Next, we have Professor Winston Chow. Professor Chow is a climate researcher with a keen interest in urban vulnerability to climate change. He is also a lead author in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report examining climate change impacts on cities and key infrastructure. He's a regular tweeter on climate and you can follow him at Winston T.L. Chow. So do keep a lookout for that. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Harvey Neo. Dr. Neo is Senior Fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities, SUTD. Uh, he also is the head of two research programs, 
the first one being cities and urban science, where he is the principal investigator of a multi-sided research on the intersection of urban technology, citizen well-being, and govern urban governance in Southeast Asia. The other research is urban environmental sustainability, where he's developing and directing research on the issues of waste, food security, and nature society relations. So in the usual, in a typical conference, I would say, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a big round of applause to welcome them. But let's, of course, do a virtual welcome to introduce our three speakers. Um, so how we will intend to run this uh, webinar is, is, of course, um, we'll start off with our speakers opening up with uh, some of their thoughts uh, on the topic, on the issue. Uh, later on, we will go into a round of uh, conversation between the speakers and myself, the moderator. And after that, we will share with you a poll, the poll results which uh, all of you have completed, and then get into a Q&A session. So I thought perhaps uh, without further ado, let me invite uh, Professor Ko to share his opening remarks of the program. Professor Ko, off to you. Hi, hi. Um, thanks, Aslam, for the uh, introduction. And uh, also a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's uh, uh, I feel very honored to, uh, to, spend the, uh, to spend this Saturday afternoon with uh, a group of like-minded friends and colleagues. Um, I think today's topic will be, will be very interesting, uh, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Um, no, rather than uh, give a lecture on my thoughts about the topic, um, maybe I'll just uh, spend a few minutes to uh, share a bit about the research, the new research center at NUS that I am leading, uh, which may also um, be of interest to many of you and um, some of the work that we are planning to do are also relevant to the topic that we are uh, focusing on today. So uh, I've been away for a couple of years, 15 years um, to, be, to be exact, and uh, I have come back to Singapore to set up this new Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. And the reason for wanting to do that is, uh, is twofold, uh, and those are also the two mandates of the Centre. The first is to produce a cutting-edge policy relevant science to help inform our policies here in Singapore as well as uh, around the region um, so that we can make more informed and more evidence-based decisions um, on, on climate science, on climate change, and also on land use policies um, which would have an impact on, on climate change. Um, the second mandate uh, and reason for my coming back to set up the centre is to to build capacity in the region uh, by training the next generation of scientists, um, of, of undergraduates, of PhD students, of postgraduate students, uh, postdocs, and, and young scientists, uh, which I'm sure many of you uh, would be well aware of or may even aspire to become. Um, I think um, there's a great uh, opportunity here and a great responsibility for Singapore to to build capacity in this region um, to help us um, address and, um, and fight uh, this existential crisis together as a nation and as a region. So uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, there are a couple of more thoughts that I do have about the topic today, but perhaps we should wait for the, uh, the questions uh, uh, to address those, uh, those thoughts in our Hand it over to Winston, I guess. Yes, Professor Winston, your turn. Yes, thanks, uh, Lian Peng, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to uh, this. Listen to us talk about this. I will just mention three brief points that I want to raise. Uh, the first looks at this sort of sustainability and uh, COVID situation at a global perspective. Uh, recently, uh, there was a uh, report that the International Energy Agency said that the uh, 
social distancing that we have uh, you know, undertaken at a global scale has led to an unprecedented 8% reduction of global carbon emissions uh, that will project that is projected to take place by the end of this year. This is uh, unprecedented. It hasn't been done before. Uh, but yet, although it sounds like it's a lot, it is still not enough to reach the goals that 195 countries have tried that have agreed upon uh, during the 2015 Paris Agreement to restrict uh, climate change to a 1.5 degree C uh, threshold. Uh, the takeaway from this is that this sort of uh, social distancing, the, the staying at home, the lack of travel both on the surface, on the seas, through the air, the, re the reduction in, in industrial outputs, uh, the, the, the cutting down of global supply change. Uh, these sort of uh, actions are driven from a personal level, uh, but this sort of global personal sustainability through this sort of behavioral change, albeit in force, is good, but it's not enough to be climate resilient. And these sort of personal, the switch from the global to the personal sustainability often detracts from the very unfair and unequal carbon burden that is shared across the globe. Uh, the carbon footprint of, let's say, a typical United States or a British uh, citizen differs and is larger than that from the Singapore citizen, and as well as our footprint is larger than uh, footprints of our neighboring countries. Uh, so that's one thing I want to point out. Uh, leading on from that is that. Um, the unfortunate uh, link with COVID and climate is that there's a loss of uh, employment. The unemployment resulting from COVID uh, also reveals that uh, removing emissions from this personal sustainability uh, is not politically supportable. There's a lesson in there uh, for climate action, which I'm going to point out now, because uh, this sort of impact, um, the, 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 the social distancing resulting from, uh, from, from COVID, uh, we need to be strategic in this in terms of climate action. Uh, there has to be strategic thinking by both the private sector and by governments in terms of sustainability for uh, future transitions in a low carbon, high sustainability economy. Now in Singapore, we've had uh, four budgets that have been announced over the past three months, uh, the unity, the resilience, the solidarity, uh, and the fortitude budgets, or as my friends always send to me, uh, is the U R S O F budgets. Uh, this were, these are put into place to cushion the blow. But then there's also, intriguingly enough, plans by the government, uh, together with important stakeholders, to restructure the economy so that we are more resilient to these sort of black swan or shock events arising from COVID. Uh, I argue, and I think we uh, we. I think my, the, my fellow panelists will, will agree with me on this, is that the same has to be done for climate change uh, under the framework of uh, the sustainable development goals that uh, the United Nations has put into place to be achieved by the year 2030. Uh, the relevant uh, sustainable development goal is number eight for decent work and economic growth. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, both the private sector and the government will have to look at how future uh, employment in carbon intensive industries such as oil and gas and uh, even for data centers which are very energy hungry uh, in Singapore, uh, how best to uh, adjust and how best to make sure that workers who are in these industries from the present and will be affected in the future, how can they adjust, uh, how can they transition to a low carbon future in a sustainable fashion. So there is that time available uh, hopefully that this transition can learn from the lessons from COVID and apply that for this sort of sustainable climate transition. Uh, the last point, uh, I want to look not at the present but in the future. Uh, I understand from David uh, that there is a large number of students in the virtual audience that's listening to me right now. Uh, I would probably like to uh, advise everyone there uh, to look out for jobs that and, and skills related to these jobs that are needed in the future when there is uh, the adjustment to a climate resilient pathway. Uh, look for how skills that can be uh, applied for electric vehicles, for autonomous vehicles, for data centers, uh, ideally for uh, carbon capture and utilization and storage, which is uh, in, the, in the pipe, so to speak, for, uh, for oil and gas in the future, or for the hydrogen economy. Uh, these require different sort of skill sets that uh, we have today. And it is hoped that uh, you know, this sort of future innovation and technology can be to your benefit. However, 
it has to be stressed that this sort of innovation and technology can also magnify inequalities. Um, if you, the Sustainable Development Goals number 10 says that uh, a key the key tenet is to reduce inequalities in society in the future. Uh, we must make sure that the gap between the digital or the innovation haves versus the have-nots do not widen at the cost of potential social unrest or potential breakdown that we'll have in the future. Uh, okay, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, back to you. Uh, and yes, I would like to hear from uh, Harvey, I guess. Uh, Harvey, are you supposed to speak next? Thank you so much. Harvey, your turn. <laughs> uh, you need to unmute, Harvey. I unmute myself already. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, so many people here. Um, 181, I see. Um, so I, I think I'll just go on a slight tangent, but still relating to the topic. First is the, uh, the title of your webinar, uh, Circuit Breaker of Unsustainable Practices, which is uh, to me is a little bit um, <laughs> ironic because when, when there's a, a occurrence of circuit breaking, right? what we want to do is to make it back to normal again. So in the normal sense of the word, after a circuit breaker period, we want to go back to normal. Of course, now they insist that it's not normal, it's a new normal, uh, which there is some um, sense to it because um, there is a lot of uh, accumulated experience that tells us that if there are intractable behavior of, of human beings, right, um, it takes a very traumatic event you know, to, to, to make them change for the longer term, not just change for the, uh, for the uh, uh, 10 years, five years, half a generation. So we can think of, um, it took a Germany to undergo Nazi, Nazism, you know, to, to completely change the national uh, psyche. But even now, half, one and a half generations later, you see that slowly it's creeping back in. The same can be said of, of Japan, Imperial Japan. So for, for the most, um, a few decades after the post-World War II, they are pretty good, you know, traumatic enough for them to really hold back and seemingly change for the good, for the better, for the long run. Um, so now the question is obviously um, whether COVID-19 is that kind of traumatic e event that, uh, that we uh, think it is, or rather the media makes out it to be. I'm actually not so, I'm not so optimistic about this. Um, we see 9-11, maybe something has changed in the, in the immediate few, few years. But after that, it, people's memory is short. And the reason why is that if people do not continue to make connection with that traumatic event, that it doesn't revolve their daily life anymore, they will forget it. So, so there's no way to, to permanently change your behavior just because there's something traumatic, especially if this COVID, right? Yes, it's, it's got huge impacts, but the majority of us do not have direct uh, uh, um, health implications, if you like. Of course, there are, like for instance, a lot of uh, economic uh, uh, fall, and it will get worse. But that would be thought of as an economic traumatic event. It won't be thought of as an environmental event at all. So, so, so that is the problem, so, which is why I don't think that there will be any fundamental change to anything maybe certain things maybe wearing a face mask would be seen as a very normal thing to do but other than that i really cannot imagine things to do to change uh, uh, for for good so so that's one the other point i want to bring up is um there's covid 19 and then there is persistent malnutrition persistent um, non-accessible to uh, inaccessibility to fresh water around the world and that kills people by the thousands every day. We don't think of that because we normalize it, because it's so far from us. Sometimes I think that COVID-19, we are so um, worked up over this, is because the rich and the powerful have a very good chance of getting it as well. You know, it's not just the poorer class people that will get it. Anyone could get it. In fact, maybe the rich people will, will get it even more because they mingle a lot, whatever, you know go to a, a crowded functions, whatever. So, so that could be it as well. So that's, that's I guess, <laughs> that's, those are the two questions I, I want to talk about, whether uh, the reasons why we are so, um, I, I guess, so invested in this thing, in, in, in COVID. 
uh, invested in it in, in, a, in a way that is very, very different. Okay, so, so, so I guess I'll leave it at, at that first. Maybe uh, the audience can have some good ideas about these questions that I have, which I don't have any answers. So perhaps uh, that, that's fantastic comments, uh, but perhaps uh, if I could just uh, lead into the questions and the comments made, uh, you know, clearly COVID-19 is a dramatic uh, event, uh, but when we think about it, are there any opportunities to to sustain some of these new norms that could potentially uh, be sustained considering the fact that we are seeing a, quite a dramatic improvement in carbon emissions, albeit it is not significant enough. But where do you think are some of the sustainable activities we can uh, continue with? Um, who would like to make a comment on that? Uh, um, is my mic still on? Oh, I'm not muted. Then, then I, I might start. I might just start. Well, there, there, I, I think there will be uh, uh, pragmatic changes. So, for example, uh, uh, our work, uh, our work arrangement might change. So there could be companies might be much more open for uh, people to work uh, from home. Okay, so that actually that may or may not be good for the environment. I'm not so sure <laughs> the calculations. I think we still can do it. Uh, let's say a, a thousand people home versus a thousand people work in the in the in the building. Is that more energy efficient? I don't know. Now I'm in my room. I'm turning on the aircon like half the day. That's crazy, you know. It's so hard, you know. So <laughs> you multiply this by one thousand people. I'm not very sure whether it's energy efficient. Yes, we save on transport costs. We save on this and that, but it's, it's not a, a, a foregone conclusion, you know, uh, it, it's not certain that, uh, you know, working from home uh, will generate less uh, energy usage. Yeah, energy is just one criteria, there could be other things. So I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, work, work arrangement is the one that I think will change. And if the sun bears out, it will be environmentally uh, positive net effect. But maybe it's not, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, Winston. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Aslam. Actually, Harvey, yes, uh, there are some data showing that the increased stay-at-home use of air conditioning and utilities is more than offset globally, especially globally. Maybe not for Singapore, but definitely at the global scale, uh, it's offset by the decrease in surface transport, which has um, which massively kicked in, especially when uh, the US and the and most of Europe and the rest of the world follow China's example, starting from March in uh, staying at uh, in working from home and social distancing so there is that discernible effect and to follow on from what uh to from what harvey says i think working from home is something that will uh, propagate forward in the future it'll be looked upon as something sustainable if industries can allow for it uh the other uh, notable impact is uh international travel uh it's it looks as though that uh, <laughs> the restrictions worldwide for aviation especially will not end anytime soon. It has a massive impact on conference travel, it has a massive impact on tourism. It will be an, it's an industry that, is, uh, that has to really look itself and try and reinvent itself massively uh, to go on uh, after the impact of COVID and uh, correspondingly it has that uh, impact on climate as well. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, this, uh, can I pass it back to, uh, pass it back to you, Aslam? Yeah, thank you. Professor Ko, yourself? Any yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> just, just call me Lian Pin, please. Um, yeah, sure, actually I do have some thoughts. Um, I guess I, uh, it's a bit schizophrenic on my end. I kind of agree with uh, Harvey to some extent, uh, but then also disagree with him at some other point, in some other points. Um, maybe I'll say the, the, the parts where I agree with him on, uh, which is the sort of the temporary nature of, of whatever positive effects we are, we may be witnessing at the moment. Um, I, th I think from the, uh, the last financial crisis, uh, you know, 08 and 09, people have uh, observed that immediately after that, there was a uh, a huge rebound effect, right? Where um, you know countries are just you know itching to get back to business and um, looking for the quickest path to recovery. In fact, we are seeing a lot of that even at this moment, even when the the pandemic isn't even over yet. 
Um, and, and so the, the, the huge rebound effect will definitely drive, drive up uh, GH, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's a lot, there's a huge, also a huge stockpile of raw material sitting everywhere that's, that's, that's you know, waiting to be, to be sold, to be used, to be consumed. And, and that will also drive up uh, consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and so on. So in that sense, um, I agree with Harvey that many of the things we are observing now may be temporary. And when, when we do get back to business, um, things might even get uh, worse than before, at least, at least for a while. But, but on the other hand, um, I'm a bit more optimistic than Harvey as well, because I think this circuit breaker and, and shutdown, whatever you call it, in different parts of the world, um, may have also given us an opportunity to to see a different way forward, right? So literally, sometimes, you know, there are reports that people in, for example, in Kathmandu are now able to see Mount Everest from from the Kathmandu Valley, which they haven't been able to do for uh, how many years, decades at least. So literally and metaphorically, people may begin to see a different future for themselves. Um, you know, from simple things like the efficiency gains in telecommuting to, to bigger things, you know, for example, in having less cars on the road when, when we do get back to business, thinking of other ways of, of travel, of, of doing business internationally and so on. So I, I think um, there may be efficiency gains uh, from, from what we are witnessing. Um, during the crisis, uh, when the crisis is over. Very good. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, I would not have imagined uh, getting 180 people onto an event that we run uh, and, and considering that this is all virtual. If this was a non-virtual event, we had to find a venue for 180 people, you know, put chairs, uh, maybe even coordinate a uh, tea break. <laughs> so there are trade-offs uh, clearly. But I want, to, uh, I want to bring your attention to a point that I think Winston, you brought up about job opportunities. And I thought perhaps uh, a report I recently read uh, in The Economist. So back in the financial crisis in 2007 to 2009, the American uh, American government came up with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And this act, they pumped in $90 billion into clean uh, energy loans and investments. So it's debatable how effective it was, but probably down the road in 2014, it's, uh, they, they, they reported about 900,000 new jobs coming in. Um, so I just want to pick your brains on where do you think how do you see that juxtapose it to Singapore's context? And where are some of the opportunities? Um, you know, at two levels, right? One is at the policy level and maybe one is at the individual level, which you alluded to earlier. By the policy level, do you think this could be something that can be reinforced? Uh, yeah, I think it has to be reinforced at the policy level. Um, with, uh, and there's a push uh, recently uh, when the government looked at its uh, climate plans uh, up to the year 2030 and beyond, uh, they have, we need to get off natural gas. It is, yes, it is the cleanest fossil fuel, but it's still a fossil fuel regardless. And there's been a push towards looking at uh, renewable energy and also uh, the potential of carbon capture utilization and storage, which, is, which can work at smaller scales. But if you want to upscale that to something reaching uh, Singapore's demand for energy, it will take a substantial amount of investment and uh, trials and deployment. So the focus is there. Uh, the concern is whether um, the current skill sets from the workforce in, let's say, the oil and gas in industry and the petrochem industry in Singapore, which I think the data show it contributes 5% of GDP and about uh, anywhere from 1,400 to 1,800 high-skill high jobs, uh, how they will be affected in the future. 
the if we were to push towards a CCUS, a carbon capture utilization storage, or a hydrogen economy, you will still need skill uh, a skill set for maintenance. You will still still need electricians. You still need high you know these sort of technological skill sets uh, in the previous industry that can be transferred over and allow them to have employment in the future uh, when the industries transition from a high carbon to a low carbon sector. Um, the same goes for transport as well. A lot of emissions occur from ground-based transport, from uh, your internal combustion engines. We know the policy uh, is put into place already. We're going to switch to an EED, electric vehicle sort of uh, infrastructure, by the year 2040, which will, be, which will result in a big dent in our carbon emissions by then. Uh, that said, how would that affect uh, bus drivers? How would that affect um, public transport? Uh, I've been told that uh, it's the way that you break buses in ICE buses is different from how you break in EV buses and you need to retrain people or your bus captains accordingly so that their skills still remain relevant with this sort of further innovation and technology. Uh, if I could also add on one, one key example, um, how this transition I would argue it wasn't that success, uh, successfully done in the US uh, based on the, the example that you gave. This sort of transition to a, you know, a, just, you know, a, a just transition, a fair transition for these sort of uh, workers in what I call sunset industries uh, has taken place in Alberta, in Canada, oil country in, in, uh, in, in Canada. Uh, they have been trying not just from the private sector side with more companies moving to renewable energies, trying to take over, uh, bring the workforce that was embedded in the oil sands of Alberta, in the oil industry in Alberta, uh, they said, okay, we are giving you opportunities because that industry, the tar sands, is going to go kaput in the years to come, and it is going kaput. We want to make sure that their skills are retained in the state of Alberta. Uh, the private sector for solar, for hydro is booming because of that, together with the provincial, uh, the regional governmental support. So it takes two hands to make sure that this sort of uh, just transition occurs. Mm. Uh, the, that blueprint, I hope, will be followed by the, by the governments here in Singapore, as well as in the region, because we our region uses a lot of fossil fuels and if we are not to go to the way of the dinosaurs this has to take place very good thank you so uh, i'd like to take this opportunity at this point to just share uh, our poll results and then later on open up to the floor for questions there we have some questions in our chat but i thought let's share the poll results first so uh, can we share the poll results? Is, it, can, is everyone able to see the poll results? I, if not, uh, just let our, uh, let our host know. Okay, so the first, the first poll question we asked was, uh, what is the most positive impact on the environment that you have, obs you have observed during this circuit breaker period? So, um, Wow, so we have uh, beautiful sunsets and clearer skies. Exactly, uh, Professor Ko, as you have said, uh, Lempin, you know, they can see Kathmandu. And I think at our end, I still remember a friend of mine posting on his Facebook page. Uh, he said, first time we have seen stars in Singapore's skies at night. So, uh, so that's the first outcome. Uh, but close is improved air quality. So quite obviously because of the reduction in uh, you know, cars on the road, perhaps. The next one is, uh, what are some of the key habits and practices picked up during the circuit breaker period which you hope to continue after 2nd June? So this one was very interesting. In fact, I was observing the, the poll results. Originally, utility usage, the consciousness of utility usage was high. So hopefully, people clearly realize they're using a lot of their aircon or fan uh, at home, right? Uh, as a... As, uh, uh, David, uh, Prof. Neil, you were saying, and um, adopting environmentally friendly behavior such as bring your own container or bring your own, uh, you know, uh, food item, food container. So I thought that is also, these two are the two strongest one. And then third, coming third is taking more walks in the park. Uh, and I think this is very obvious. I don't know about people here. When you go to the park, you see, uh, you know, they are really enjoying the walk. Uh, more free time to you know uh, watch the sunsets 
the last one was uh, the last one I think is quite interesting. Uh, the consensus among the speakers was that there's only so much individuals can do. <laughs> But uh, the consensus among the audience, and perhaps this audience is a, is a more environmentally conscious audience, uh, the ill effects will worsen in my lifetime. We as individuals need to make changes in our own lifestyle choices and habits. Uh, I just want to open this to uh, our speakers to share what are your thoughts on the poll that we have done. Perhaps uh, if I can bring... Um, Prof. Neil, into the, into the discussion to just share quickly your thoughts and then uh, Prof. Lien Pin as well. So, Prof. Um, Neil? I, I think uh, I, I'm not, not surprised by the uh, poll. I mean, of course, this is a very informal and uh, yes. cannot be uh, seen as totally scientific, but it, it tells us something. First, uh, that this bunch of people are self-selected already. <laughs> so they probably are interested in this issue. They probably have the motivation or the desire, if not they if not already have those, to, to, to make some changes. So, so these are the people, I don't know who they are, they are out there, the 180 of them. You know, these are the people who already form some kind of narrative, some, form some kind of idea, with or without COVID. They have already that kind of idea, uh, you know, brimming in, 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 in their mind. So, so I suppose this is a catalyst. So for this bunch of people, um, it's good. It, it, it actually uh, moves them, accelerate their, 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 their progress. So, but then these are a, a minority of the people. So it's not easy for, or rather for most people, they don't really think of you know, COVID or any traumatic events and link it to climate change. And this is one of the problems of, uh, of, of getting people's buy-in in climate change policies or climate change issues. Because it is so amorphous, it is so big, it is everything and yet nothing, for many people that seems to be the case, that it is very hard to articulate a, a narrative for them. And, and I think this is, is one of the key challenges. And mind you, just now we were talking about aviation, we are talking about energy usage. Yes, these are the major, one of the two major contributors of uh, climate change, um, but we are missing out things like consumption. <laughs> I would argue that during this circuit breaker period, we are consuming even more. Everyone is just going online buying nonsense things that they have never even bought before. All right, so now they have the time and they go click, click, click. And the other thing is um, our diet, meat production, nothing to do with COVID. It will not change. And uh, the, the meat industry itself, it's one of the uh, top three major contributors to climate change as well. So that is the reason why I'm slightly uh, uh, pessimistic. And I tell you, uh, meat eaters, uh, <laughs> I don't know what will make them stop taking meat. It's very, very difficult. Nothing is traumatic enough for them. Ask Winston. <laughs> Winston will be able to answer what, what will make him give up meat. <laughs> okay, Winston, we'll bring you in, but first I want to hear, uh, Lien Pin, what are your, what are your views on uh, the poll results? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, actually, I was, in, I was surprised that the, uh, for, the, for question one, that the, the answer on, on uh, observing wild animals closer to us uh, didn't come up as, as one of the top uh, answers. Um, maybe that's just because you know, in Singapore there's nothing there's just not, not, not many uh, uh, unobservable, unusual, tip, norm, normally unobserved animals that are now observed by, by us during this, this break. But, but in many parts of the world, I think, I think there have been lots of reports on, on uh, you know, more frequent or, or, or sightings of wildlife moving into uh, urban areas or cities and so on. Um, and that, that's always been um, very interesting to me um, because uh, uh, it's interesting at an intellectual level because uh, I, I think for many of those cases, um, the animals may may always be there. In fact, but but people just never uh, took the time to to slow down and and, and observe them. So when when things are have have slowed down by not by choice, uh, people start to observe things more carefully and and see the the animals uh, moving around. Um, 
but but also I, I think again going back to my 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 optimism I, I think having whether it's real or not whether the effect is real or not the fact that people think they are observing more animals um, may also mean that they they may learn to appreciate them more and may may want to have more of those kinds of experiences um, after after the, the crisis is over and so um, so they may be willing to support um, changes or policies or whatever to to allow them to to do so um, even though some of the uh, the observed effects may be temporary but the the fact that they are they are um, uh, the experience that, that they have experienced this they might mean that they they would be uh, more willing to support uh, policies that will allow them to re-experience this again um but but then again that they're also uh so that there are always two sides right so the uh, the flip side is uh ha having these animals closer to us may also bring some uh, uh disservices or some costs right you, you see uh, the, the otters chewing up people's koi fishes and, and who knows what else they've been doing uh, in, 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 a, in a more vacant uh, city. So, so that, there's also cost to having uh, wildlife closer to us. Um, but but, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's a good opportunity in any case for us to, um, to be able to observe uh, wildlife uh, more than before. Maybe that's just coming from me being an ecologist. Wonderful. In fact, uh, my, my, the most exciting observation my kids gave me was the fact that they saw otters at the Pandan Reservoir <laughs> recently and frequently, in fact. So, uh, okay, uh, Winston, quick one on uh, meat. Then we open up to the, to the floor. Okay, be before I go and talk about meat and also uh, how I also disagree, I agree with Harvey that changing meat behavior and personal behavior is very difficult, but I disagree with him on uh, being too pessimistic and I'll, I'll explain why. But first things first, I'm going to change my background to uh, some of the, one of the best memes I've seen uh, in uh, <laughs> recent times. Uh, that it, because nature, it, there's that meme that goes about that nature is returning because of COVID. So they've got a, ho a whole lot of uh, fantastic pe uh, pictures like the Loch Ness Monster appearing in all parts of the, in, in the Venice canals and so on and so forth. And this is my personal favorite uh, sent to me by uh, Kanan from uh, MUS uh, SG STEM organizer uh, looking at how dinosaurs have returned to Bishan Park. Uh, okay, so changing behaviors, uh, it's good that the poll shows that people have been going out. It's good that people have, uh, in, in, Sing in urbanized Singapore, have been re-exposing or exposing themselves to nature and, and uh, appreciating the benefits of that. Ties in very nicely with Liam Ping's uh, ongoing work, the importance of nature as a potential solution uh, to uh, some of the worst excesses and impacts of climate change. Uh, the thing, though, is that how this experience with nature ties into changes in behavior, how it links, uh, hopefully links up to uh, uh, increase sustainability with behavioral change is very, very difficult to do. Uh, in my classes in both uh, previously at NUS and now in SMU when I teach climate change, what I do is I get my students to perform the hashtag climate challenge where for a unspecified period of time is up to their own choosing. They try and minimize their carbon footprint, which includes not eating meat, going vegetarian, uh, uh, going uh, full vegan, uh, not taking uh, private transport to school or to campus. Uh, some very adventurous students have attempted not showering for a week with, uh, shall we say, very uh, interesting consequences. But that the point of the exercise is to show that while your mind says that you have to change your behavior to account for you know, uh, climate change or sustainability, it's very difficult to do so, but it can be done. Some people, some of my students have actually continued on with this climate challenge uh, in the years since I, they, they were first exposed to it. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, the second thing I want to say is in terms of um, pessimism for action, I would disagree because um, in recent times, they've been a massive push uh, by the youth of Singapore 
manifested in SG Climate Rally, manifested by a lot of uh, the, the NGOs that have consolidated and have worked towards uh, pushing uh, this sustainability, this climate action agenda. Um, people are listening to them uh, at through, through the governmental portals, through businesses, they, they, they understand that, look, uh, we might be, we, we have to realize that the use of the day will be the ones disproportionately affected by climate change effects, by our unsustainable practices. It's time to actually get that done. And from what I've seen, uh, both on the ground and also uh, at uh, the, the, the governmental level, at the NCCS, the National Climate Change uh, Secretariat level, people are paying attention. And it is a very good push. And I'm rather optimistic that uh, action, greater action, will be taken in the years to come. Right, uh, back to you, Aslam. Thanks. Awesome. I think you're muted. I'm on mute, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so I think now uh, it's time for us to open up to the floor. If I could uh, just share the screen a bit on uh, some of the uh, so called house rules for asking questions. So, okay, we, we do encourage you to ask questions directly to the speakers. So, if you do want to do that, there is a raise hand function. Uh, which you can, if you just scroll down, you will see there's a raise hand function on, on all the list of attendees. You just raise your hands and we, when we see it, we will, I'll call your name out and you can speak and we unmute you. Uh, of course, if you do not want to do that, you can post it in the chat function, which goes to our, my, my uh, friendly moderators uh, who are supporting me. Uh, we do have some questions already in. I might start with that. And then um, again, if you do have any technical questions, you need to, you know, if you're having trouble uh, asking questions, you can ping uh, Zixian through the chat function also. So let me start the ball rolling with one question from Karen Sim. Uh, this is the question to all the speakers. Um, many have said that we need systemic change in the way we structure our economies and our societies to face the global challenges ahead. Do you think that this is going to happen in Singapore and in what ways? Uh, one of the things I'm really hoping to, will change is the way we grow, we view growth. Example, GDP and how growth ought to be never ending. So perhaps we can start there, uh, open to the floor of uh, all three speakers who wants to start first. Dian you want to take that first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I can I can give an example from my um, area of uh, of interest, which is nature based climate solutions. Um, I think I think many um, organizations, you know, both corporate and public sectors, are beginning to um, see the importance of investing in in climate solutions. Um, um, both to address climate change impacts and also to explore new economic opportunities. Um, and one such solution is to look at how we might be able to invest in protecting the existing carbon stocks in our natural ecosystems like forests or mangroves or whatever, and also to uh, restore some of these ecosystems and start sequestering more carbon that way. Of course, this is not going to be the you know, silver bullet in any way. It's not going to uh, reduce emissions in any way. They will be able to help corporates offset the emissions uh, for sure. Um, but it is a necessary part of so-called you know, bending the curve, uh, which is needed for us to achieve the, uh, uh, the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. In, in fact, in the, uh, in the IPCC special report that was, you know, came out a couple of years ago, one or two years ago, uh, in, in every one of their pathways towards achieving those goals, uh, in addition to reducing emissions, um, every one of those pathways also include nature-based solutions. So we do have to change our policies and practices when it comes to how we deal with, uh, with nature, with our natural ecosystems. 
And at the same time, those solutions also may become new economic opportunities uh, because um, by protecting those carbon stocks, we also generate, we could also generate carbon credits and those carbon credits uh, become, uh, become a commodity that could be traded um, and it could be uh, a new source of, of investment and, and uh, revenue for some of these uh, sectors. So, so I think those are, uh, uh, those are a few examples of, of, uh, of, of actions and, and solutions that we could be looking at. Okay. Uh, Avi? Oh, need to unmute. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think this, this, some aspects of this, this question, I'm very hopeful. Um, I think there will be changes in, in the way we view certain segments of the workforce, for example, the foreign workers. So I think the, the welfare will be much more uh, seriously considered now. I am not surprised that there will be legislative changes to uh, the way um, we um, uh, uh, oversee uh, dormitories, for example. I think that will be, for sure, that will change. Uh, and that's the change for the better. It's unfortunate that it has to take this kind of thing to, to prompt uh, 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 the government to move in the direction and to also, to also make the uh, dorm operators realize that they are operating an unsustainable practice. Okay, so, so that will change, I think. And um, I think generally, you know, and this relates back to the uh, work from home kind of thing, I think there might be a change in imperceptible change, if you like, in the way we understand how work is produced, how work is valued. So I cannot say how far this will go, but I, there will be changes along those lines. Um, and that's good, I think, I feel. Um, but was it Karen or Catherine or her name? I can't remember. But to the extent that we evaluate the entire economy in a different matrix, right? I don't think so. I, I just cannot imagine. And it's not our choice. It's not Singapore's choice. It has to be a, a choice of the, the, the global community that suddenly GDP is no longer an important criteria. Um, I just don't see that happening. Um, I hope I will be proven wrong, but I, I don't think that will happen. Okay. Winston, a quick one. Very quickly, I agree with both Lemping and Harvey. Uh, on top of what uh, Lemping said about the special report 1.5 that the IPCC released in 2018, the key takeaway from that report is rapid transitions in all aspects of society have to take place for uh, climate change to happen. Uh, it ties in not just with the application of nature-based solutions, it also ties in with the societal transitions that Harvey has very eloquently pointed out. We have neglected the, uh, the, the migrant worker issue for COVID. Uh, my concern is that these sort of inequalities in society uh, for those vulnerable to heat or to floods or to so on, not just in Singapore but elsewhere, will be overlooked. That cannot happen. It has to change. Uh, I share Harvey's optimism that it will change, uh, primarily because of COVID. It, it focuses the attention so much on, on these inequalities that no policymaker, no business can afford to ignore that. The challenge, though, is, is it enough? And secondly, do we have the time to do so? Uh, it's a question that Singapore is trying to answer, but it can, we cannot do it ourselves. Uh, the, whether or not a shift, like what uh, Harvey said, whether or not a shift away from the very GDP-focused metric happens, we can suggest, we can push in our own little way, uh, our own little red dot can push that forward. But if the big, you know, the, the, the big dinosaurs, like the one behind me, if the US or if, uh, if China or the UK or the EU remains uh, stuck on that GDP-focused paradigm, that carbon paradigm, then we, we don't have much choice, right? So uh, that's a question I don't have the answer to, I'm afraid. All right, that's mm -hmm. all, uh, Aslam, back to you. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we have quite a number of questions in chat, but I think some of the individuals who posted in chat, your names are also here. So why don't we just move on to allow people to ask questions. Uh, I see Lastrina with her hands up. So perhaps we could uh, unmute her and let Lastrina ask your question. Lastrina? Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, Can we point the spotlight on her? 
as she, as she speaks, oh, I don't know if you have a, yours is a photo, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, no uh, worries. Go for it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So um, I have two questions, but I think one of them is somewhat uh, answered already. So I'll just ask one. So I just wanted to highlight that in Singapore's case in February, uh, NTUC already set up Job Security Council to assist workers with uh, immediate needs um, for those who are affected by COVID-19. And then in early May, MTI announced this Emerging Stronger Task Force, um, which has 17 individuals. But if you look at the profiles of each individual, um, uh, I would say it could have been better and more diversified. Uh, and you know, when we are talking about post-COVID economy, when we're talking about more sustainable economy, but we don't see any representatives uh, from the renewable energy companies, for example, or we don't see more climate leaders in that task force. Um, and this week, for example, DPM Heng mentioned that um, Mr. Tharman will also be heading the new jobs, uh, National Jobs Council. Um, no details so far, uh, but I was wondering for the speakers, with all these like councils and task force that we have set up this year, um, do you think the current makeup and the direction of uh, all these new task force, is it good enough to guide Singapore through a post-COVID-19 economy? Um, so yeah, that's my big question there. Thank you. Sorry, Lastrina, you are from which organization? Just uh, for our info. Uh, I'm with Singapore Youth for Climate Action. Okay, Singapore Youth for Climate Action. Wonderful. So, speakers, anyone to pick this up? Who wants to go for it? <laughs> okay, Winston. Uh, afternoon, Lastrina. Lovely to hear from you. Uh, the task force, uh, I might be wrong in this, but it's, uh, it's primarily representative of the major industries in Singapore. I understand that uh, oil and gas is there and some of the other petrochem uh, industries are there. Uh, the other bias I think I noticed is that it's uh, very gender heavy towards males. Um, that can be addressed hopefully at some point, but whether or not it, uh, it, it addresses the resilience aspect, the, the bounce back ability of the economy uh, immediately after the impacts of COVID. Uh, that to, I think to me, uh, my other panelists might disagree, that to me that looks only at the short term, it looks only for the next 18 to 24 months or so. Uh, we know, uh, for those of us involved in climate action, our short term is not that, it's probably until 2030 or beyond. Uh, I guess that if they don't, uh, if the panelists, or no, if the, um, the, the task force of, of 17 people uh, and chaired by, I, I, I think it's uh, Minister Desmond, um, they, if they don't consider the longer term ramifications, uh, I highly doubt that they won't. They will be, it's, it's in the nature of these task force to look at uh, the long term implications of that. And uh, given the uh, big shocks towards um, the price of oil, for instance, due to a combination of geopolitical factors and also because of COVID, uh, if they don't, if that industry doesn't see the long-term necessity to change uh, business practices to accommodate for a low carbon intensity future, uh, then I fail to see how it can be resilient in any time period, be it the short, medium or long term. So I, my, my point is um, there are larger structural economic issues at play that will force these industries to look beyond just the COVID timeframe and to include a sustainable uh, climate timeframe. Very good. Uh, uh, can I follow up on uh, Winston for ahead. a little bit? Yeah, just, just to say that, um, but uh, yes, I agree with you completely. And, and to add on, there are a lot of things that Singapore, our government, our people, we, it's totally beyond our control. I think in the next, in the very near future, the aviation industry, the hospitality industry, we have no idea what's going to happen. Nothing to do with us. People might not come just because, you know. So I think that that is a really major worry. Since uh, aviation and, and tourism are both uh, two of our important industries. What happened to these people who are employed by uh, uh, these two industries? I have not heard anything about this, um, partly because nobody knows what's going to happen too. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that actually, yeah. Um, next one, I'd uh, like to perhaps suggest uh, Cheng Hui. I think Cheng Hui, you have 
a question already asked uh, in our chat directed at Professor Cole. If I could bring you in to ask that question, you have your hands raised. Uh, and just introduce yourself, uh, your background perhaps as well. Sungway, can we unmute Sungway? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi everyone, I'm Chen Hui from one of the public sector organizations. So I wanted to ask Professor Ko regarding, so um, just to provide some background, in Singapore we have some goals set for 2030 where we have the expanded rail network to have decentralization in our um, workspaces. Also recently in the budget, we also have heard of the 2040 goal to have to electrify all our vehicles uh, from 2040 onwards. So besides this 2030 and 2040 goals, what are other climate, climate change related policies which will require climate relevant science to support? Rob Koh? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Zhang Wei. Um, again, I'll, I'll just uh, fall back on my favorite topic, which is uh, nature-based climate solutions. I think, uh, again, as I mentioned before, um, there, there's a lot of, there are lots of opportunities for us to, uh, to tap into when it comes to um, how we could use nature to help address many of the climate problems and also to develop new economic opportunities. Um, and there's a lot of uh, science and knowledge gaps that, that need to be addressed as well. Uh, to inform decisions in those areas. So that's, that's, that's exactly what the, uh, the new uh, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at NUS is, is hoping to, to achieve. Um, for example, when it comes to understanding the potential for, um, for nature-based carbon in the region to help offset some of your uh, our uh, emissions uh, to help us achieve our climate targets. We don't really have a very good idea at the moment uh, where these uh, opportunities lie uh, in the region. Um, there's still a lot of uh, need to understand how do we capitalize on them, when do we capitalize on them, uh, what to prioritize and so on, and how effective and efficient they are compared to some of the other solutions, uh, non-nature-based non solutions and so on. So that, that there are actually a lot of interesting uh, and important uh, uh, research questions that could be asked. Um, and, and maybe I also just add that since, since we're, we are speaking to quite a, a big group of students, of young, I suppose, high school, secondary school, JC students, um, this might also be a good opportunity to say to this uh, population of students that um, I, I think this, this, is, this is also a good time to, to think about how you could contribute to addressing many of these solutions. D despite, what, despite, despite some of the pessimism you might have heard during today's discussion, I, I, think, I think I remain very hopeful. I'm, I'm always hopeful, I'm always very optimistic. And I think the hope comes from, will, will have to come from what the, the next generation can do. And, and th that's people like, like yourselves. Um, we, the three of us on the panel are all farts, right? We, we have some expertise maybe, we have some, some imagination, but, but I think most of the solutions um, will, will have to come from, from, from the next cohort um, and who, who will unfortunately also be bearing most of the consequences of climate change. Um, and, and so, so nature-based solutions is definitely one, one area that, um, that would require a, a lot of, um, of, 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 of manpower, a lot of, uh, of intellectual capacity in the next um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, maybe even seeing some of you uh, in, in, in universities and uh, being able to, uh, to, to interact and work with some of you. Very good. Uh, we probably, we are at 4 p.m., slightly, slightly off 4 p.m. right now. We could probably extend for a bit and uh, take a few more questions. I still, I see Rene, you have your hand up. Uh, so can I invite Rene to ask your question? 
Hi, thanks, Aslam. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the question is for any one of those um, three distinguished um, speakers today. Um, I would just like to pick up on the point that Professor Neo made earlier about consumption. And he's, he's right. Um, consumption really is a big contributor to um, the changing climate. But um, I also believe that consumption is being driven by demand or, or, or you know, and, and so if we could drive people to demand for more sustainably produced goods um, and services, then perhaps we could um, change the way we consume stuff. Um, and I'm not just talking about food, like, like you know, meat and, and stuff like that, but one of the more basic things that we consume every day is rice. Um, we've seen in Vietnam um, that um, improving on the way farmers produce rice and getting these certified by the government. And so you'll see rice packages saying sustainably produced rice in Vietnam. And yes, the prices are driven up, but you know, if, if you can get farmers to do that, and if you can get all the other things that we consume to produce more sustainably, then wouldn't that help um, contribute towards resolving our climate problem? The second point I would like to bring up is that, okay, we're gonna um, produce more sustainably, but that also jacks up the price, doesn't it? And this brings in the point that Professor Chow was, was, was talking about earlier about, um, you know, a widening divide between the haves and the have nots. And so my question for all three of you is that how do you compromise sustainable production and price such that these sustainably produced goods and services can be accessible to everyone and not just people who can afford them? Thank you. Uh, uh, let me um, briefly answer Renee. Um, her question is quite complicated. There are multiple uh, um, sections to it. But I, I would just like to say that um, there are two aspects of consumption that we can think about. Yes, I agree completely with you about you know sustainable, uh, sustainable practices in both the production of food and other things that we use. Um, but actually, my reference point for making those statements were, were not those kinds of things. It, it, they are actually the kinds of things that we don't actually need, but yet we keep on buying. A uh, sustainably uh, produced um, mobile phone is meaningless if you change it, uh, uh, change new, a new phone once every six months. Okay, so that it defeats the whole purpose of sourcing for a sustainably, uh, sustainable uh, produced uh, uh, phone. So, so there is that element as well. It's, it's, it's both the way the, the thing is produced and the frequency in which we consume the thing. And, and mind you, there are certain things that there's actually, actually observably, uh, no real practical reasons for us to have it. And yet we have um, a lot of ornaments and all these kinds of things. You know, we buy it because we think it's, it's nice. And we put it there, we forget about it. So, so there is that kind of, uh, of, of consumption as well. And I think no matter how you sustainably produce those consumption it is still not a, a, a good kind of consumption in, in my mind uh, so so and the argument extends to uh, a sustainably produced meat I think yes it is better than you know conventional meat but at the end of the day it, it, it still doesn't go far enough so so that's 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 my uh, 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 where I'm coming from basically Anyone else want to take this up to answer? Uh, maybe a quick point pointer on how consumption is an issue. Uh, the other point about consumption is, is the gap or the inequality in consumption between folks in, uh, let's say, Southern California in the US who want big SUVs and live in huge 
huge, uh, huge allotments that uh, have big lawns that require lots of watering. These are, you know, it, it's those are status symbols. Uh, it they are that that level of consumption is so uh, unsustainable, both in terms of resource use and for the climate. Uh, but yet most your average, I, I hesitate to say your median or your average. Uh, um, you know, person living in that part of the world thinks that is normal. Uh, normal for us is different from normal from other places as well. And uh, consumption levels are, you know, it, it is massively unequal depending on where you are. And it has obvious impacts on, that footprint has obvious impacts on uh, the environment, on sustainability and on climate. How to redress that? either it has to be done if, if we subscribe to the uh, sort of uh, capitalist idea is to price your products properly to account for the negative externalities of uh, you know pollution or climate impacts of carbon accordingly uh, that's one way to change behavior to change the consumption to a more sustainable outlook on the flip side uh, if you price things wrongly then you will have a uh, you know social unrest like what happened in in Paris and in France with the uh, yellow vest uh, uh, riots are uh, because of the uh, increasing taxes that account for this environmental impact. Uh, another way which you know Singapore is trying to do is to try and push uh, the idea towards uh, or nudge people towards the idea of a circular economy, a zero waste economy uh, through a whole multitude of policy instruments. Uh, that is another way forward. The, the efficacy or the effectiveness of that is yet to be revealed and I, I uh, but that's another way out. So there are ways of doing so. Um, but I, apart from that, I don't think there's. A, I, I can give a good answer <laughs> on how to change consumption patterns to a more sustainable uh, outcome. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say, Arthur. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I have a lot of questions in the chat group. I would apologize if we could not cover all of the questions. I'll try to pick a few here. Uh, there's one interesting one that I thought uh, would be interesting for the panelists to share their thoughts. Um, it's from Jesse. It says, let's get practical. Given the changed, changed behaviours that we have seen due to COVID-19, particularly the potential for change that we have uncovered, what do the speakers think could be low-hanging fruits that Singapore should be reaching for? from a climate change perspective. That's the first point. Also, are there any tweaks to the economic framework systems you would introduce or recommend that could be implemented to effect change? Third, finally, what do you think of nudging as an approach that we can adopt, use to affect consumer behavior? I think this is a nice segue into some of the questions Renee asked and the replies we are getting. Um, I don't know, Professor Ko, you want to, Winston looks excited to answer this question. <laughs> but I wonder if uh, Lian Pin, you want to... Yeah, any... may, yeah, maybe I can start uh, just, just uh, with, the, with the one part, maybe one, one part of the question, uh, one solution. Uh, well, the, the, the most immediate and obvious thing that comes to mind is, is telecommuting, right? Um, I think we've all begun to, to get very used to doing that, or well, at least I, I have, uh, maybe not all of us. Um, so, so perhaps after the, the crisis, um, it, would be, it wouldn't be unimaginable to have a portion or proportion of the workforce continue to telecom telecommute uh, rather than having to uh, be physically present in the office and so on. I think that small um, change in how we work may may have a, a significant impact on on transport and hence on greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Winston or Harvey, anything to? Uh, quickly, uh, I don't want to take too much time from Harvey. Uh, apart from um, telecommuting, the fact that I see so many people outdoors running around because there's a lack of uh, ex you know, uh, exercise avenues since they've closed swimming pools and they've closed the stadium, which I, uh, I would like to go to. Uh, it 
lend, you know, the, the focus is a, a low hanging fruit is pointing out, look, if you want to keep healthy because of COVID, keep that going because a healthy population actually has a, is a much more sustainable population, not just in the climate perspective, but in, in a medical perspective as well. Uh, it's a co-benefit, so to speak. Uh, I will just quickly answer the nudging question. Uh, it depends on the context and it can work in certain places where if you appeal to, if you find that right pressure point and in Singapore, if you appeal to people's gasuism, it can work. So if you look at your utility bills, you can see uh, how your, your power usage relates to a comparable you know, uh, HDB unit or a, a housing unit. And if you see, alamak, if I am spending more money than my neighbor, I need to die, die, find ways and change my behavior to save money so that I am uh, equal or better. And there's some work that shows that this sort of nudging actually does work in that Singaporean context because it appeals to people's desire to be better than their neighbors. They don't want to lose out on that. So it depends on that context. If, uh, if one is aware of that, nudging can work to that uh, extent. Okay. Good. Avi, anything to add? Yeah, no, just to say that I, I, I think I, it's still back to the work arrangement. It took us decades and decades before flexible work hours is implemented or accepted, uh, uh, you know, sector-wide, government-wide. So I, I think now the, the, the idea of work from home should be able, it's one low-hanging fruit, I think, that um, if the government is serious about this, you know, they can even set the example to say that, you know, from now on, you know, there's always the option for work from home for a certain amount of time, maybe 50% or whatever. So, so I think that can be done. It's, it's easily done. And that's assuming what uh, Winston says is correct. Us working from home actually is a net gain. It's not a, it's not a loss to us, okay? So, yeah. Okay, very good. I'll just take uh, probably two more questions. Uh, I see one hand raised, so we'll take that question and then maybe one more from the group chat uh, and then we can perhaps uh, close off the, with a summary. Uh, so we have uh, Ong Kit Gin Kit, uh, his hands up, I'll unmute you. Hi, All right. uh, thank you, thank you very much. A um, couple of questions. One is that at every event, sustainable event, or um, whether online or in the old days, it's almost always, of course, for all of us uh, who are convinced that you know climate change is real and so forth. And we hear a lot of motherhood statements from whoever is up there on the panel. So how do we reach out, sort of asking the government for another campaign to reach the public, you know, to take more action? Uh, don't be at the receiving end waiting for things like, you know, fun facts and stuff like that. Um, we seem to be very sort of dependent, you know, on a few people to do something, um, more of observers than participants. So how do we get a public participation? So that's one. The other one is a uh, different question. We have hardly uh, any reverse logistics infrastructure. So how do we move that, you know, eventually? Oh, and by the way, I'm actually in bioenergy, so I'm making energy from uh, uh, energy generation from biomass. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Who wants to pick this up? Question is on uh, how to get more ground sub activities and on reverse logistics. Anyone? Okay, Winston? If I can answer the ground up activity and... Um... It's, you're, you're right in, to a large extent that we are preaching to the converted or, and uh, our impact is uh, more or less uh, limited to that bubble that we speak to. It's a challenge uh, that uh, I, I've faced uh, ever since I've, you know, I studied uh, climatology and uh, urban climate in the US where there's a lot of uh, people who, shall we say, uh, exhibit very contrarian behavior towards climate change. Uh, but I've learned that if you want your impact to go beyond uh, what you, uh, your own primary audience that you're comfortable with, you have to force yourself to be uncomfortable. You have to go and speak to audiences who are not so friendly and who potentially can be adversarial in nature. Uh, it's, it's a challenge. 
uh, thankfully, it's not that big a, uh, an issue in Singapore. Uh, but if you want to broaden your outreach, you first have to show that you, you, you don't talk in motherhood statements. So uh, in a, a class that I just finished it at SMU, we looked at uh, what's, you know, we argued whether the sustainable development goals are motherhood statements by the UN. The short answer is that it's not because there are quantifiable metrics that are there to show that the data indicate whether or not your city, your nation, your country, or your business is actually improving or is uh, you know answering the sustainable development goal. And for us in Singapore at the governmental scale, at the academic scale, I guess this is where our research in providing that data is critical. Uh, Lemping's uh, Nature Based Solutions uh, Institute in the US, Harvey's work at the uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design in urban, you know, for, for, for sustainable cities, uh, and my own work, we are trying to answer those questions. We're trying to show that, look, the actions that we recommend, they actually do contribute positively. Uh, the, and, you know, to broaden your, your outreach in Singapore, you have to participate in webinars like this. You have to talk to students, you have to talk to industry practitioners. It's a challenge because communicating our findings, communicating the importance of sustainability, uh, there's no one size fits all approach. We have to adapt our approach accordingly. And it's something that I think all three of us, if I can speak for uh, my, my colleagues, it's something very difficult to do. Uh, hopefully that answers your, your first question. Uh, I, Sorry, but I don't have an answer for your second question, uh, Jinket. My apologies for that. Uh, but back to you, Aslam. Okay. Anyone wants to uh, reverse short. logistics? I have no, no answer to okay. that. No. Yeah. Uh, just, just a quick one to, to add on to what Winston said. I, I think uh, at a very practical level, uh, the, 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 well, in my personal opinion, the, the quickest uh, way to get people, especially younger people, interested in, in what we're talking about, you know, people beyond this bubble, is for somebody to tell them that there is a career uh, to be made uh, by going into this area. Uh, I remember when I was uh, you know, growing up, secondary school, J JC levels, you know, stage, uh, eight, nine out of ten of my peers were engineers or became engineers because the, the whole psyche was, was that, that there's a future and a career to be made in engineering. So if, if people now uh, understand and see that there is a need in Singapore to develop this capacity to address climate issues from all, all disciplines in the engineering, um, the ecology, uh, architecture, ge geography, whatever, uh, economics, um, then, then I think more people will pay attention to this, more opportunities will be developed and there'll be more uh, people going into, into this area and, and, and developing more solutions and ideas for how we can address this problem. So I think, uh, I think, uh, Ginket, I can answer a little bit on logistics. I used to be in that industry. Uh, I think reverse logistics is a very, very good question and it's something that perhaps uh, is, is still nascent and developing. Uh, it's a complicated uh, area because uh, uh, it, it talks about, you know, retrieving some of these uh, so scrap products and then how do we, you know, move it back to, through the logistics change. But I do note one thing. NEA is looking at the recovery and reclamation and destruction of uh, ref spent refrigeration. So this is something perhaps it's just a start that we are moving into. Uh, but I think that is an interesting area that we might see more development in in the coming years as we start really, really looking at waste reduction. So uh, I'll leave it as that. And uh, maybe uh, one final question before we let the speakers do a quick summary or I can do the summary. Uh, do you think the transition to circular economy would be sped up after this pandemic? Final question. <laughs> okay, no. three words. Three words. Uh, I hope uh, no. so. I hope so. <laughs> okay, I don't so. think so. <laughs> I hope so, but I don't think so. Again, it's, it's the same re uh, uh, explanation that I have that the, 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 the link between circular economy and, and climate change is not direct enough for, for people to see. And if the government, uh, government feels that the people don't really want this, they would not don't want to do this because it is not a very simple thing to do. So I, I don't see that. I will be shocked if this 
pleasantly shocked if this happens. <laughs> okay, so we have a no, and Winston, yours is? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, very good. And uh, Yen Ping? Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, instead of saying yes or no, I, I would encourage the, the students listening in to, to join us and to prove uh, Harvey wrong. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, I think it would be a good time for us to uh, perhaps come to the end of the session. We have uh, we've spent almost one, I'd say about a good one hour, 25 minutes or so uh, on, on this session. We had originally planned it for an hour and we've uh, gone above that. And I do want to thank the speakers for kindly uh, allowing us to do that, you know, very graciously still taking questions and replying and giving very, very frank and honest feedback. Uh, quite clearly, this uh, topic is a big topic, sustainability, the impact of COVID-19. The jury is probably still out. Uh, some say that, uh, I mean, there is a view, of course, that, you know, we've not seen historically big dramatic uh, changes uh, or impacts on the economy leading to you know environmental consciousness uh, and, and taking up in a big way so this past evidence doesn't point to that direction but of course in the past 10 15 years ago the cost and you know technology advancements the cost of production were different so cost of production has also evolved so i'd say the jury is still out but I think one thing gives me a little bit of optimism in this dialogue. Uh, despite Harvey's uh, pessimism or presumes pessimism, actually I do, I do detect a tinge of optimism in your voice uh, and your energy as you share your thoughts. Uh, and clearly from the other speakers you know, who are projecting uh, a, a more optimistic, hopeful future, I think the, the power is in the hands of the young. And we have many, many young people in this, uh, in this session. We have about 108 students. In fact, a third of the registrants were actually students. And I'm quite hopeful that if we all put our minds to it, a cathartic event like the COVID-19 pandemic will prompt us to really look hard about how we live and how we think about the future. I personally am seriously thinking about the future because I have three young children who are going to own the world uh, after I leave the world. So we must you know, do something to hand over the world to them in at least uh, better than you know, what we have created for them uh, in the last few years. So with that, I want to thank the speakers and the audience for all uh, dialing in and staying with us. Um, I also would like to uh, tell the audience, uh, many of you have asked questions. I apologize, we could not cover all your questions. Uh, but, you know, we are taking note of them. And, um, of course, uh, we will reach out to the, to the speakers to see if they are keen to, you know, provide a response. And then we could post them in our social media. But it's, it's their choice after all, so we don't want to force it on them. Uh, before we end, can I just get the, uh, my fellow colleagues to just show the slides? Uh, so, the, as David has shared, we are a collective of uh, individuals who are coming together to really bring illustrious speakers to share their thoughts, discuss and debate issues. And, you know, like, like our speakers have shared, without, without bringing knowledge to the community, right? How can we effect change? Because it has to start with knowledge and understanding. So we are planning upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, some of the webinars we have, uh, we have in mind are uh, to have one in July, in September and November. The topics uh, are still tentative. Uh, we have lined up some speakers who potentially could speak on these topics. If you know of any speakers, do reach out to us in our social media. Let us know. Uh, and if you have any topic suggestions, again, do let us know. Can I go to the next slide? Uh, this is how you can reach us. Uh, we do have a very active uh, Facebook page. Uh, you can use the QR code to uh, join our Facebook page, spread the message to all our friends or your friends. Uh, we do also have a sustainable SG website. This website is... Uh, is it's, it's, we are growing this website, we are developing it, we are posting articles just to educate uh, our, our users on the, on the website. 
again, uh, if you do uh, have any interesting articles, ideas you want to contribute, let us know as well. Uh, next slide. This is our first, uh, this is really our first webinar and we are here to learn how to improve and do a better event the next time we organize it. So we have the QR code in front. If you could uh, kindly get, spend some time just fill in your, the, your feedback and let us know so that we know how to improve uh, ourselves for the next one. With that, I think we will come to the end. I would like to invite everyone to just give a virtual thank you uh, clap <laughs> uh, to all our three speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, Winston, thank you so much, Lian Pin, and thank you so much, uh, Harvey, for your time on a Saturday. And thank you all of you who have dialed in to this event. So I wish you all a very good weekend, a very good afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>